Super Bowl 32 was the first Super Bowl championship in Denver Broncos history. You want to tell me the 37-year-old man doesn't want to win this game? Man, oh man. It was important to really go out there and play for John. He was our captain. I knew I had a great quarterback. He oh, dies oh, inside oh, the five-yard line. My goodness. There was so much baggage that we shared after we won that game. This will be the sweetest kneel down in John Elway's career. I grew up in Southern California. I wore Broncos shirts to school. Now, you got to come in the next day feeling like a winner. Go ahead and salute them, Denver. They have shocked everybody. This one's for John. I knew in my heart that it was not John Elway's last game. There's no way he doesn't want to repeat with this group of guys. Final thought here, John, before they drag you away. Uh, will you retire now? Is this the Holy Grail? I'll talk to you. It's the biggest decision of my life, so I'm not going to rush it. We just had a feeling that he wanted just a little bit more. Once you get a taste of winning that championship and you got a chance to do it again, it's kind of difficult to walk away from that. Everybody keeps congratulating me for coming back. The thing is, I never left. It's it's Nothing can derail the Denver Bronco Express. And they are world champions once again. Defense, bring it up. Coming off their first ever championship season, the 1998 Denver Broncos knew the only acceptable outcome was a repeat performance. Well, the offseason after the Super Bowl 32 was probably the best offseason we ever had because we felt like we had a real good team coming back. We were hungry. Even though we had won one, it was almost equally important to, to go back and do it again. We felt slighted in 1996. We lost the game to Jacksonville. We let one championship slip away. And it was such a disappointment that the next year was pretty easy to get everybody up for the year. We won some tough games down the stretch, but that got us ready for the 98 season because they know that if you let up any game, it's very easy to get eliminated. You know, as we were going through the process and getting toward the end right there, you know, I think we all kind of knew this might be John's last year. I've got a lot of years to live in retirement, and uh, the last thing I want to do is pass up a the opportunity to play one more year of football because that's uh, that's all I've ever done. You know, John had had an incredible career. He was already a living legend, had already cemented his place in the Hall of Fame. Elway could have walked out and had the storybook ending, but he's like, as a good team, I'm gonna come back and do this again. I think he knew he had the team. He knew he had the running game. He realized, hey, we got a chance to go back to back. A lot of times I've always thought that football players have a tough time realizing when they're done or if they can still play because of the way they look out of their own eyes. And so I had a great conversation with my dad and he thought I could still play. I did too, but I just wanted that confirmation from him. Plus, you know, like I said, we, uh, we had a great football team coming back and really felt like we had a, another chance to go back and compete for another world championship. Bottom line is I'm, I'm coming back so we can win. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's the only reason you play the game is to win. I guess it starts from when you're young. The quarterback is the assumed leader of the team. And some quarterbacks embrace that role, some, some don't. But John, he fully embraced that role. He was a great leader, not just for the offense, but for the entire team. Hard double wing left, point dagger, wide shallow cross. I want to kill her that. John was dominant because one, he was blessed with some unbelievable ability. Not many people had his arm. He also had this incredible leadership quality about him that that brought people together. He was always the guy watching the tape. He's always the guy that made sure that he was always prepared for anything that people could bring to him. You feed off of him without him saying a word. It wasn't until you know our first practice that I found out quickly who he was. You know, I think you know, I ran a slant route and I dropped the ball. And I did not drop a lot of passes in my whole career. And he was either gonna yell at me, scream at me, give Coach Shanahan the signal. I didn't know what was gonna happen, but instead, he literally, you know, patted me on the back, said, that's all right, Eddie, let's go get it again, and threw me the ball the very next play. I remember dropping a pass, and I was scared to go back to the huddle. I'm like, can y'all just tell me to play, and I stay out the huddle, because I'm standing close to John. Mentally, I was off. He got us in the huddle. He said, hey, you're here now, you're good. It came right back to me the very next play. He believed in his teammates. He inspired them. He helped them become the best versions of themselves. He wanted not perfection, but he wanted excellence. When you're around somebody like that, it becomes contagious. And so when you're in that huddle, you're, you are playing for number seven. That's the guy that you want to try to get his respect. His competitive kind of fire, you see it, and you try to match it because you know you have to. You don't realize what a competitor he is. I mean, he just loves to play. He loves to compete. And uh, he does not give in, and he's going to find a way to get it done.
Our mindset was we have a better team this year than we had last year. You know, we, we still had John Elway and Terrell Davis, so it was like, we were gonna win every game if you have them, right? It was such an exciting offense. They had all the weapons, all the exciting players. Rod Smith, you had Ed McCaffrey, Shannon Sharp, obviously the Shanahan running game. They keep him over there, there was nobody over here. You just seal that outside, man, I'm gone. We were solid on defense. We had a lot of playmakers. We was really down for whatever the challenge was. Remember, we had Neil Smith, who came from the Chiefs, but now was on our side. A lot of these big games, huge. I remember Tyrone Braxton, Bill Romanowski, loved Steve Atwater, and that's what was so fun about the team. You had stars all over the place. We were on to something special. We just didn't know it at the time. We had a great, great team. A lot of Hall of Fame caliber guys. I and mean, we were really tight. The chemistry was really good. The confidence from our team never waned. Like, we could be in a fight, and we knew when the clock went to zero, we were going to come out on top. Everybody wants a piece of you. Everybody come to play. You get the best from every team you play, and that's why you have to be ready each week, week in and week out, because we knew we were going to get challenged because of the fact that we'd won the Super Bowl the year before. With their eyes set on another Super Bowl victory, the Broncos rallied behind their veteran quarterback and got off to a hot start. They're stopping their feet. More than 75,000 at mile high, and we're underway as the Broncos defend their crowd. We lost two good players in Brian Abebe and Gary Zimmerman, but our offensive line's playing with a lot of confidence. I think our players will come in and play well. Elway on first down from the 18, faking, looking, McCaffrey trying to go low. McCaffrey stretches out to make the catch. In Denver's home opener, John Elway passed for 257 yards and a touchdown, and the Broncos beat the Patriots 27 to 21. I'm just going to take it one game at a time and really enjoy it, and uh, I'm fortunate to be on a good football team. The following week, the Broncos cruise past the Cowboys to open the season 2-0. Darrell Davis, 63 yards. But Elway injured his hamstring late in that game. He's coming out. Yeah, he can't play. And you look down at Bobby Brister getting ready on the sideline, and he doesn't even have time to warm up. Coming up, the Broncos face adversity early in the season and must rely on depth and defense to remain undefeated without their starting quarterback. After winning their first two games at home, the Broncos hit the road for an AFC West battle with the Oakland Raiders. Elway was determined to play, but after re-injuring his hamstring, Bubby Brister entered the game in the second quarter. Brister, play it. Locked it. Griffin, touchdown. You never want to see your quarterback go down. Luckily, we knew John was going to be returning, but Bubby came in and just didn't miss a beat. You know, my job was just keep the Ferrari running until John got back healthy. <laughs> Bubby's mentality and the way that he played the game, I think that he could step right in for me and, and everybody trusted him. He kept the team you know, alive in the locker room, on the field. He has tons of energy. He was there to say, you bet, coach, and play what he was asked to. And he did play and we were undefeated in the games that Bubby played. You know, we had a lot of faith in Bubby and uh, rightfully so. He was a fantastic, amazing NFL quarterback. Brister, Gazaman, McCaffrey's open for the touchdown. What was fun about that team was that we had the names that people kind of knew, the household names, but we had a lot of playmakers. Everybody was important to the success of the team, and that was what Mike always preached. Broncos run it well behind Terrell Davis, slow it well behind Bubby Brister. They do not turn it over at all again today. From the top to the bottom, we all felt like we were on the same level. That we felt like, hey, we're a vital part of this team. John Elway is out with a bad back. Bobby Brister will start at quarterback. The nagging injuries is, you know, what was difficult for me. So, Bobby had a big part of that 98 season because of the fact when he did come in, he played so well. Here's Brister, the Eagles blitz. Brister going deep to Smith, who's in a neighborhood by himself. Boy, this is way, way too easy now. I was able to, uh, to help us win a few games, but we, uh, we had an unbelievable team that year. They were just dominating people right from the jump in the regular season. Mike Shanahan called the dogs off in a number of games midway through the third quarter. You know, after about game five, it was like, okay, who's gonna beat us? We felt like we were Super Bowl favorites probably for the whole season, but there's no guarantees. You still have to go out and get it done. And man, do we have some guys that went out and got it done. Blitz coming, Warren Moon, not there yet. 
Mitchell in trouble, and Steve Atwater coming on the blitz. Denver saw its record improve to 6-0 with a win in Seattle. Final score 21-16, the Broncos remain undefeated. The momentum continued after the bye week against Jacksonville in a game that saw Terrell Davis become the third back in NFL history to reach 1,000 yards in the first seven games of a season. If you ask me, I think Terrell Davis right now is the best, the best player in the National Football League. Halfway through the season, I had over 1,000 yards, and that was the first time I'd heard somebody mention 2,000 yards. Week to week, you're just trying to win games, and now it's easier said than done. It's hard because you can hear the outside noise. As Denver advanced to 7-0, the day was capped off with Jason Elam's record-tying 63-yard field goal. I remember my holder, he looked up at me right before the snap and he said, hey, you know this is for the record, right? <laughs> and so that's what you don't want going through your head right before a kick. Well, what do you guys think? Tied to record, longest field goal in the history of the game, 63 yards. Yeah. Elway to throw. On the run, into the end zone, touchdown. A hard fought battle in Cincinnati tested the Broncos' grit. With the game tied at 26 and two minutes left on the clock, Elway embarked on the 45th game-winning drive of his career. Down the middle, has his man, that's McCaffrey. John's deal was there was always this quiet confidence and this smirk on his face, like regardless of the situation, he'd walk into the huddle, you felt like we got him right where we want him, we've got a chance to win. We knew if we went out and played like we're capable of, we could beat anybody on a given day. And I think personalities just all mixed, but we also had the same goal. Eight and O is the best start in franchise history for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos headed back to Mile High Stadium to face the top-ranked San Diego defense. First time we've just gotten word on Elway, he strained a rib cage muscle, will not return. He's going to give you everything he got. If you said he couldn't go, you didn't try to push him because he knew his body very well. Play Vegas, Brister rolls right, looks back left, throws a wide open Terrell Davis touchdown. Good job, Bobby. Good job, baby. Go, big pitch. Here comes Brister. And he is in for the touchdown, McCaffrey. It's with John Elway hurt tonight. Bobby Brister will start his fourth game. They're averaging 35 points a game with him at quarterback. And, of course, Terrell Davis on the ground, averaging 5.5 per carry. And nothing can derail the Denver Bronco Express. They have not lost a game in almost a year. It struck me when they got to double-digit wins and no losses that this might be a team that, that can run the table. I'll never forget Glenn Cadrez. He consistently said it, 10-0, and we're six away, and it was him, but we all thought it. You know, what Mike did so well for so many years was, you know, keep those expectations really high for us. We, we were thinking about going undefeated, and that was going to be our goal after with winning a world championship. Weeks 12, 13, and 14 saw the return of John Elway as Denver beat the Raiders, the Chargers, and the Chiefs once again. With three games remaining, the team had clinched a playoff spot as they headed on the road to face the Giants. The potential of going undefeated puts a ton of pressure on you, and it's mostly because you have to answer that question. You already got the pressure to repeat, and now you got the pressure to go undefeated. It's that that unseen opponent. That's all people could talk about was, you know, being undefeated. You know, my mindset was, hey, let's get ready for the Giants and let's try to take care of business. The Denver Broncos are looking for that perfect season. The Giant players, they're excited about playing a 13-0 team. They want to ruin history, not be part of it. They played a really, really great game. We were off our game just a little bit and it still went down to the wire. Right here. Smart and hard and move it down. The Broncos found themselves trailing late in the fourth quarter and an unsuccessful Hail Mary meant their unbeaten streak had come to an end. A lot of people would suggest that, hey, you, you didn't have the pressure of, of having to be an undefeated team. You could just relax. I would prefer to go undefeated on the season, but maybe it was a good thing. We just really let ourselves down when we went up to New York and, and, and you know, and lost a football game, but it wasn't the end of us. His New York Giants have knocked Elway and the Broncos off their first loss of the year. Now, people don't always realize we went a calendar year without a loss. You know, try it sometime. That's pretty hard to do. People are pointing it out, you know, now that we've lost that game, all the focus is on the 2,000-yard season now.
We now return to Super Bowl 33, Back to Back, presented by Children's Hospital Colorado. While an undefeated season was scratched off the Broncos' goal sheet after week 15, there was still hope for another record to be broken. Terrell Davis needed 199 yards in the final two games of the season to reach 2,000, but Miami was determined to rain on Denver's parade. In our 15th game of the season, with the number one seed, we got the best record in the AFC, so I gotta go for it. Well, that game didn't turn out as, as well as I would have liked. Terrell Davis, 16 carries, 29 yards. We had everything locked up, and so I think that, uh, you know, we weren't as ready to play the next week in Miami as we should have been. The game plan, it seemed quite odd. I'm like, man, this is, it's not our normal game plan. We normally have more detail. We actually did not even put a game plan in for the Giants or the Dolphins. We just were going to kind of take a little bit of a mental break, but still practice hard and do the little things the right way. But we weren't going to put a game plan in, especially against Miami, because we thought we might face them in the playoffs. It'd be an advantage for them and not us. And the Broncos, who went 13 and 0, are now 13 and 2 with Seattle coming up. Miami was very thrilled about beating the Broncos, and they wanted the Broncos to know that. I just left the game thinking we are, we are a better team. Like there's no way we would lose them if we played them again. That did re-energize our team and say, okay, now our focus is back on winning the World Championship. You know, after that Miami embarrassment, we uh, we ended up getting it turned back around. We're really good about disciplining ourselves, holding each other accountable. We have an opportunity with this group of men. We don't know how long we're gonna to be together and we wanna we wanna get the job done. So that's two games we lost in a row. We're on the bus and Derek Lavelle, who was another running back, is sitting next to me and he's got the stat sheet. He said, you almost had 2,000 yards in this season. He thought it was over. And I did too, because I didn't think I was going to play in the last game of the season. The numbers on Terrell Davis, he needs 170 yards today to break the 2,000 yard mark. I'm expecting maybe I'll get in, I'll play a half, and they'll pull me out. I get a couple of carries and I'm just getting you know, seven yards here, five yards here, I get 13 yards there. So in the first half, the yards are starting to pile up a little bit. He's zeroing in on 2,000. And I just try to keep doing what I've, I've been doing all season long. Just play the game and let whatever happens happen. John Elway passed for four touchdowns to put the Broncos up 28 to seven early in the fourth quarter, making him just the third quarterback ever to throw 300 career touchdown passes. It was now time for Denver's star running back to take center stage. Terrell Davis can become only the fourth player in NFL history to go over 2,000 yards. And he is seven yards shy of that mark. The crowd is going nuts and everybody's screaming in the stadium. And this crowd is on their, they're on their feet. I am getting ready for the ball and then my mind just starts racing. What if I fumble this ball? What am I going to do once I hit the 2,000 yard mark? What if I lose yards on this play? The ball snapped as I'm thinking. Second down and six from the 47. Davis breaks the tackle. He's got He's got 2,000. I look up on the scoreboard and I see the two 2,000 yards flashing. That's uh, That was pretty cool. I ain't going to lie. That's pretty cool. Well, to be honest with you, any time you win an award like that, a rushing title or an MVP title, TD would be the first to tell you that, you know, it's a product of the offensive line. We had Harry Swain, we had Dan Neal, we had Tom Nalen, Marsh Lair, that we had T-Bone, Tony Jones. Those five guys and then guys who rotated in and out, man, they just, they paved the way for me. That was really the foundation of a great run game, and then you throw in Shannon Sharp as our tight end, who was blocking his butt off, Rod Smith, Ed McCaffrey, Howard Griffith. I mean, we just had everybody contributing to that run game. You're part of a history where there's only a few guys that have ever rushed for 2,000 yards. So yeah, it's an honor to be a part of that. He had great vision, and when it's time to stick his foot in the ground and get upfield, he did it. He was the best in the league. You know, running the ball is what made us so successful because we everything was based off the running game. And to have a guy to be able to give the ball to a guy like Terrell Davis, you know, was tremendous. We had a rule in our locker room, as far as receivers, your guy could not make the tackle on number 30 because we knew how special this guy was. It made the game so much easier when you have a running back that got to stack eight in the box to stop him. It was pick your poison. Do you want to be beat by the pass or do you want to be beat by the run? And here's the thing, you stack eight in the box, you still ain't gonna stop him. Terrell and that offensive line, you just don't see 
that kind of dominance in the NFL. When he was able to get over you know, 2,000 yards in that last game, everybody was so proud because they knew they were a piece of his success. TD, 2,008 yards rushing for the season. The Broncos had the best record in the AFC and the league MVP in Davis. Just as Mike Shanahan suspected, their first opponent was Miami. In Super Bowl 32, we had to go on the road and win two games on the road. And so for us to have the home field wrapped up and the success that we had at mile high, uh, we felt good about having those playoff games at home. Plus, you know, to have Miami come back in there, you know, three weeks after they you know, beat us pretty good down in Miami added the extra incentive. We were chomping the bit just to go out there and, and prove that what happened in Miami was fluky at best. I wasn't worried at all. They were talented and they were good, but I just, you know, it's just one of those feelings where I'm looking around the locker room thinking we are way too good uh, to lose to these guys again. When it came to playoff football, we knew anybody that stepped across the line with us who's going to dominate, and it just happened to be the Dolphins on that day. We definitely marked that date on our calendars, <laughs> and, and we showed up and uh, we, we took care of business. I mean, halfway through that game, you're going, they beat you guys? I think they wanted to prove a point. I thought they just beat the dog out of the Dolphins. A dominant performance left no doubt that the Broncos were the real deal. The offense scored three rushing touchdowns on their first three possessions. Meanwhile, the defense came up huge, holding Miami to just three points. Marino steps up, throws intercepted. Hey! We thought we could run the football on them because we didn't really have a game plan the first time we played them, and we thought they might go in there a little overconfident. We put it to them, pretty much. We put it to them, and uh, only thing I can remember in the Miami game, it was a short, my long run, and I was out of wind for a long time. But it was a fun game, you know. Guys make plays all over the field. Neil Smith for the touchdown. Seven. Afterwards, you know, we were in super hype saying, yeah, we did it, we did it. No, we had, still had a lot more work to do, but uh, that was one sign that they like, were on the right track and we, we got to continue doing what we're doing. Man, that was a great, great team effort. We talked about a three-round fight. That's round one. That's a great start. Then we come back, great to work. Oh. <laughs>
The Broncos responded on the next possession with a scoring drive of their own. One of the big plays in that game, John threw a ball that was thrown towards the south end zone. Eddie McCaffrey made the catch. It was a big, big play. I remember on that play, it just felt like everybody in the stands could exhale. John, short drop, looks right, plenty of time, throws, pass over the middle, caught. Howard Griffin's at the goal line, touchdown, Denver! The players needed, the fans needed this too. I don't think there was ever a panic at any point during that game. It was just, get it turned around now. We cannot let what happened in 96 happen again. It showed what kind of football team we did have to be able to come out in the second half and really dominate that second half and take over. With the margin cut to just three points, what happened on the ensuing kickoff was the momentum shift the Broncos needed. Elam to kick it off, either Megan or Kevin Williams, and he kicks it short and high. They have to let it hit, it's a free ball. It is a free ball. It is loose on the ground, they die for it. Broncos say they've got it. Sometimes you just need a spark. That was the spark. It was a special teams turnover that got us the ball back. The wind was blowing so hard that the return man couldn't catch the ball because he had to run up too far. And right then, I was like, my high magic is here. Huge play, we, we needed the ball back. Good placement down, Jason's got it on its way. It is perfect. That was actually probably one of Jason's best games ever because he was playing the wind. We started you know, running the ball more effectively and TD had over 100 yards again, which was you know, kind of always the formula to winning football games for us. Terrell, 15, 10, five, touchdown! Can you say MVP? The fourth quarter began with Denver ahead 20 to 10 and the Broncos' defense came alive, forcing three turnovers to close out the game. Look at the hit by Steve Atwater. That's one of those hits that you see on NFL films where you say, oh. I still remember that play. You know, he just ran a little slant route, and I saw him, and I ran in and made contact with him, and he coughed it up. Romanowski falls on it, first down Denver. It was fun taking the ball away because if you take the ball away, most of the time you have a better chance of winning football games. Six turnovers by them, and we didn't have any turnovers. So if you win the turnover ratio by six to zero, you're going to win most, most games, and that's the way we played. Testaverde fires over the middle pass, deflected, and I intercept it again. And you can make your reservations for Miami. The Denver Broncos are going back to the Super Bowl. They are AFC champions for the second consecutive year. Ah! John Elway is going to have the opportunity to be the first quarterback in NFL history to start in five Super Bowls. How about one last message for all your fans here and around the country. I love you! First of all, we beat a heck of a football team today. Very well coached. Our players stepped up. They made the plays. They're the ones right there. Look at them. Fantastic job, guys. And thank you, fans. Best coach in the NFL, period. <laughs> Denver was now one game away from becoming back-to-back -back world champions. When we return, the Broncos prepare to make history. We now return to Super Bowl 33, back-to-back, -back, presented by Children's Hospital Colorado. You're going to hear this a lot in the next two weeks. You're going to be going against Dan Reeves, your former boss in the Super Bowl. What about going against Dan Reeves in the Super Bowl? Well, I'll be honest with you, at times we were best friends. You know, he's just done an incredible job in Atlanta. Well coached, you're playing hard. It's going to be a great game. We're just happy to be there. To a man, the Bronco players insist. It's not about a coaching feud. It's about one thing, win the ring. In the weeks leading up to Super Bowl 33, there was speculation that a shared history made this game personal. But the Broncos blocked out the noise and remained laser focused. One of the things that I remember vividly about, you know, both Super Bowls here, 32 and 33, those were business trips. It was, we got a job to do and our job's not finished until we take care of Atlanta. We got to act like this is our first time here and, uh, you know, we're as hungry as ever and we want it more than anybody in the world. Mike Shanahan helped us prepare really by doing what, we, what we've been doing all year long. The way he went to motivate guys and keep us chasing that cherry all the time, the carrot on top of the cake all the time was, was what he was best at. And so, you know, he had a rare combination of having a great relationship with everybody on the football team, but also having his thumb down on us. And I think that's, 
you know, really what made us that good also and the fact that the challenge that Mike gave us. We were really dialed in mature football teams when it came to the purpose for being there. I think everybody was locked in. We always was. We never did individual stuff. So it made it easy for us to, to stay focused. Each guy that you had on the team was like a captain of a football team. And so we had a bunch of captains, a bunch of leaders, and that's why that year was the type of year it was. That team in 98 might be the most mentally tough team that's ever existed in Denver. I wasn't even really concerned about the Falcons. We were already prepared for the game. And so everything else was just more polishing. We practiced hard every day. We didn't try to overwork them by hitting them, but we did things full speed. And then we tried to do the little things the right way to make sure we were ready for the game. And that was the great thing about Mike Shanahan as a head coach. You never felt a panic. You never felt like he was doing things that weren't true to who we were. And that was reassuring to know you can go into a game knowing that the game plan you had was the best out there. There we go. Denver Broncos and the Dirty Birds, right here. They ain't want to see us here, baby. They ain't want to see us here. You can see it in their eye. You can see it in their eye, baby. You are the world champions. They don't respect you. We've been here two weeks. A lot's been going on. And now they're going to play. Yep. John Elway, you wonder if this is his last game or not. In talking to Mike Shanahan, he says John Elway will retire. This is what we played so hard for. Just remember, we can't win it in the first quarter or second quarter. we got to play 60 minutes of Bronco football. We'll be world champ. Let's go. Broncos on three. One, two, three. Broncos. Let's go, baby. It's something we dreamed about it's since we were a little bit of kids. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We have 60 minutes to find and get out and win this thing on three. One, two, three. Win. Win. And we are underway, Super Bowl 33. The flash bulbs are off, and so are the Falcons. Tim Dwight at the 10, the 15, the 20. Takes it to the outside, has a little room, 25, 30. Tim Dwight trying to turn it up and trying to turn it outside and does. Atlanta got off to a fast start on the opening drive, moving the ball all the way to the Denver nine yard line. But a big defensive play would keep them from converting on third down. Chandler drops straight back, pressure, and he's down. Romanowski's got him, and down he goes at the 17 yard line. Thanks to Bill Romanowski's monster sack, the Falcons had to settle for a field goal. It was now time for John Elway and the offense to get to work. Number one, we knew we were playing a good football team. They weren't getting enough credit. You know, they were 14 and two as well. And we knew they were gonna take away our running game, or at least try to, but we still wanted to run the ball because we thought that would help us with the passing game. Come on, baby, get in the end zone. And he is spinning. Is he into the end zone? No, he's very, very close. He is brought down as he was upended about the one yard line. The Broncos capped off the 80 yard drive with a one yard touchdown run by Howard Griffith. But the seven to three lead came at a price. After setting up the Broncos' first touchdown, Shannon Sharp came up from his crucial 14-yard reception limping. Watch right here, Ray Buchan is going to come and hit him right on his left knee. Sharp stayed in the game, but on Denver's next possession, it became clear he needed medical treatment after a missed catch resulted in a Falcons interception. Hey, that's all right, shake it off, shake it off, you'll be all right. Denver's defense ensured that the turnover was meaningless with a huge stop on fourth and one. Fourth and six inches. And a toss right side, bounce deep as Anderson. He's in trouble, and the Broncos have him. When Catrez played a big role on that play, it remains 7-3 Denver. Word from the Denver bench, Shannon Sharp will not return to the game. You can't have a you know a guy go down and just have a big drop off. That team did not have a drop off really anywhere. Regardless of if you were a starter or a non-starter, you were a part of the team. You always made us better. We're all one. We had trust, we had faith, we had belief in each other. And so it didn't matter who played. It didn't matter what position you put him in. That guy was going to dominate. Elway relied on backup tight end Byron Chamberlain to open things up for Rod Smith and Terrell Davis, setting up a field goal by Jason Elam. Kick on its way. It is through the uprights. It is now the Broncos 10, the Falcons 3. Atlanta responded with a big drive of its own. But once again, a stout red zone defense forced the Falcons to settle for a field goal attempt. Here's the snap. The hold, the kick is on the way. It's up, and it is oh, no, no good. 
Morton Anderson's miss was just the opportunity Mike Shanahan was looking for. Mike Shanahan, a very, very aggressive coach, as we've been pointing out before, one who likes to attack a defense. The thing that made it so cool is that coaches changed the play right before it happened. Kubiak and Shanahan come to me and say, hey, we're going to call, keep pass, and instead of you doing this, run a post. What I realized is throughout the first quarter that Ray was following me around and they were shading over towards Rod, and Coach Shanahan noticed that as well. We could see beforehand that since that free safety was jumping the crossing route, that if Rod did a little stutter um, comeback post, then he have a great chance to get open. And he said that we're going to tell you, we're going to tell John, we're gonna, not going to tell anybody else. I want to go uh, near left with a uh, C counter motion. Bang 19 handle quarterback keep pass right X post. Usually when coaches draw plays up in the dirt, they don't work. But when you have John Elway and Rod Smith, it works. Oh, it's going to be wide open. Red 28 hundred. Elway boots and rolls to his right, stops, loads it up, throws down deep the middle of the field. Rod Smith's got it. Here we go. 30, 20, 15, 10, 5. Rod Smith, Denver touchdown. 80 yards for John Elway. John threw a perfect ball. Rod made a great catch, and we got a little momentum at that time. I just cared about us winning. To me, it was backyard football. My friends versus your friends, you have no chance. After 17 straight points, Atlanta managed a field goal to close out the first half. Here's the snap, Morton on the way, it is up, and this time it is good. So Morton Anderson hits from 28 yards out before halftime. It's now Denver 17, Atlanta 6. In the third quarter, it appeared cracks were starting to show in the Broncos game. Elam White's the snap, the kick, it's down, it's on the way, it's up, and it is no good! So the Falcons with an opening. Hey, Greg, they got no choice but to throw now. We actually told Greg Robinson, put the pressure on us. We knew that we could load the front up and, and stop their run. With myself playing a lot of man and, and Darian Gordon that water playing a lot of zone on the other side, Tyrone Braxton playing a lot of man. We wanted to go get that ball back and give it to Elway. Chandler drops straight back, no four-man rush, looking left, pass deflected, it's up in the air, pass gonna be intercepted. This is Darian Gordon. He did never surprise me anything he did. I mean, him returning the punts, him intercepting passes. I don't think he surprised any of us by the plays that he made. Chandler throws to the end zone. Pass is going to be picked off. Picked off, and Darian Gordon, we go again. 25-30, 35-40. Let's go, baby. Let's go, baby. Give up a touchdown. You, know what I'm saying? you can't get up a touchdown. You haven't yet. You're not going to. Third and fourth quarter, we were having fun. I just never wanted that game to end. Caught a pass from John Elway in the fourth quarter. That was the last completion that he had. That is, uh, you know, pretty cool. Elway with an empty backfield, runs a quarterback draw, lunges to the goal line. He is in. Yeah! Touchdown, John Elway. We fall over the goal line together on the QB draw, and there's a couple bodies on top of us, so we're just kind of pinned face mask to face mask. And I just said, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he just started laughing. He's like, you're an idiot. And it was a great moment that, you know, we won a championship together and our second one in a row. Super Bowl 33 is history. The Denver Broncos have beaten the Atlanta Falcons 34 to 19. And they are world champions once again. And if it's not his last game, it sure seems like it. John Elway, I've just been informed, is officially this game's most valuable player. The best part about Elway winning the MVP for that Super Bowl is that the Falcons dared him to do it. Great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you bro. At the end of the day, John had three, almost 340 yards passing. We kind of dominated the game on both sides, but mainly in the passing game because they did try to take the running game away from us. He embodies a competitor. He embodies a champion. He embodies what we all strive to be, and that's the best version of ourselves, man, and that's what John was. I don't know if it was last one. Hell no! Keep the pressure on. I thought very hard about coming back in 1999. I know we had a really good football team again coming back. Physically, it was starting to take a toll. And I also wanted to be one that stepped away maybe one year too early instead of one year too late, and so therefore, riding off on the sunset with two world championships, I thought was the best way for me to to go and uh, so he decided to retire. When John Elway retired, honestly, it was like, good. Not that we were glad to see him go, but like, that's how you go. That's how you do it. We all graduated from high school, we graduated from college, 
I'm just graduating pro football. You know, I've got all these thank yous, and I'm not going to make it through them. John's success with the Broncos is, I mean, I, I don't think there's anybody you could point to and say single-handedly raised a franchise from where it was to where it is now. Even though he lost a lot of big games and some Super Bowls, he never gave in, worked extremely hard, and was able to get the job done at the end with a couple Super Bowl wins. You stay long enough and you're good enough that you can string back-to-back -back Super Bowl victories together. That's a nice way to end it. Four words. This one's for you. One of my favorite things about back-to-back -back Super Bowls is the Broncos were always the lovable losers because it was always they got to the Super Bowl, but they lost. Now, when you tell people you're a Broncos fan, it's associated with winning. We can hang our hats as being fans of one of the best franchises in the NFL. The margin of error is, is really, really small. So when you can win one, that's cause to celebrate. If you can win two, and by the way, win them back to back, you have put yourself and your franchise in rarefied company. And I think it elevates you to a place that's made of marble and stone and is not going to be chipped away easy. To be able to look at what we accomplished as a group, it always would be cherished. You know, that's the one, you know, we'll, we'll look at that and be like, man, you guys realize what we've done. Ladies and gentlemen, the 98, 99, back to back Super Bowl champions. We all scattered around the country, around the world after we won, you know, for whatever reasons. We didn't all get to finish our career together. That was a special time for all of us, and I think one of the moments that we'll never forget. And in order to hold on to those times, we've got to go back to it. 25 years ago, the Denver Broncos enjoyed one of their most historic seasons in franchise history. Today, we welcome back that dominant 1998 Denver Broncos team. The further you get away from the magic, I think the more you appreciate how beautiful a season like that is. Like any franchise, there's going to be up years, there's going to be down years, but this is a good franchise and they will be back and they'll always be making the efforts to be that great team. We have new ownership, we have new coaches, staff, new players, but something about those trophies, they're still there. There's a lingering effect to winning. And it took a long time for us to win a world championship. My 15th and 16th year, it was a long wait, but I know I gave everything I had. I worked at it hard. It was important for us to win, and it was important for us as a football team to make our fans proud of us. 